and sorting, recommendation, playlist generation. Um, there are a few challenges about this problem uh, to highlight. Is one, that emotional descriptions often lack a singular, well-defined answer, which makes it difficult to collect brown truth labels. Um, and two, um, there's no dominant acoustic feature really for uh, musical emotion that has yet emerged, um, which is really what we're going to be talking mostly about today. Um, and then third, um, emotions uh, change over time. So, uh, prediction of musical emotion is really a problem that spans two stochastic domains. One being the space of human emotions, which you could represent with text labels, such as ontologies or unstructured terms, or uh, parametric models of emotion, such as valence arousal, um, which is what we're going to look at. Today. Um, and the other uh, domain being the acoustic signal of music. So, um, as, I, as I said, we're working with valence arousal, um, where valence indicates positive versus negative emotion, and arousal indicates emotional intensity. We actually oriented arousal valence, but essentially the same thing. Um, and this comes from psychology research. So, um, if I just plot um, a few terms in the um, far corners, uh, if we talk, uh, start top right, high valence, high arousal. Um, we have joyful down to angry, over to depressing and up to content, and of course we can um, look at a whole range, we have a whole, whole gradient of uh, emotions that we can represent in this space. Now, to highlight what I was talking about before in terms of collecting ground truth data, and we get to test the audio, um, if I play music for a group of people, it sounds just like it does on my laptop, um, <laughs> we, get, we get a whole range of answers, and none of these are any more valid than any of the others, so we need to take all of them into consideration. Um, and what we've done in a lot of prior work is to model this as a simple two-dimensional Gaussian um, and try to parameterize it automatically. Um, so as far as collecting our ground truth data, we, um, we developed a game called Mood Swings where players were pair, uh, paired online competing to, uh, to label these uh, songs for us. And we collected more than 150,000 AV labels <coughs> over 1,000 songs. Um, and to collect a corpus uh, from this, this larger database, um, we sub-selected 240 15 second clips um, and we tried to pick ones that uh, uniformly span the AV space um, and then subject them to even more um, focus. Um, one of the criticisms that we had about this approach is that because it's collaborative it's, it's competitive, um, that perhaps that's biasing what we're collecting. Um, so the data set that I'm actually using here was collected with Mechanical Turk, same songs. Um, but um, we, we found that the data was highly correlated with the Mood Swings data set. The one thing that we really like about this set is that we have, um, we have a lot more ratings. We have about 17 uh, people on average have rated each clip, and we have second-by-second -second views. Um, and this data set is publicly available um, for anyone to use. So um, as far as selecting features, um, really the, the issue is that there's no underlying theory um, from music theory to inform the design of emotion-specific features. You know, unlike other domains like speech processing, where you know we can at least all agree that MFCCs are motivated by a, a speech model, um, I'm, I'm sure we could disagree on how good they are. Um, but you know, most work on this has concluded that essentially um, it's a combination of many domains, such as rhythm, tempo, key, uh, mode, timbre, etc. Um, but most approaches that have tried to combine these domains really haven't um, been able to get um, much better performance. And I think Mirex, um, the Mirex competition, is, is really the best example of this. The first system in 2007 that um, was the best was uh, by George Santakis, and he just used MFCC <coughs> and uh, spectral shape. So about 16 dimensions total. Um, I'm showing all the systems here on the right, and I've just uh, basically made a histogram uh, of, uh, of the data and plotted it as a heat map so you can sort of see where the, the peak of the distribution is. Um, 2008, um, we went up to 56 dimensions, and now we're introducing things like feature selection, dimensionality reduction, where George was just using an SVM. Um, and we're only going from 61 to 63. 2009, uh, this guy got up to 65. I, I, I was under the impression he was using over 100 uh, dimensions worth of features. I couldn't find a reference on that, so I didn't put it on the slide. Um, and then just in 2010, um, here's somebody at 70, and they were, they were doing some pretty sophisticated uh, feature selection, dimensionality reduction. And again, um, they are really hardly any better than George was with a pretty uh, simple approach. Are these all the same data set? Oh, yeah. yeah that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, the takeaway is that there is some information there, but not all of it. Um, and of course, it's all in the signal because we're able to 
to discern these things. Um, so instead, what we want to do is to seek uh, to learn these feature representations uh, directly from audio uh, with, with magnitude spectra using deep leaf nets. Um, so here we get features that are specifically <coughs> optimized for the prediction of musical emotion. Um, and, and these models that we learned can potentially shed new light on the relationship between uh, the acoustic domain and emotion traits. So as I said, we're using deep leaf networks. Um, the building block of DBNs is uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, um, which are uh, Markov random fields with hidden units. I'm not going to go too uh, into detail about these, but for people that have never seen them before, um, they're essentially a two-layer model where we're trying to learn a projection to reduce the dimensionality and to reconstruct the data. Um, and that, that's, that's really what you need to know um, to understand what I'm talking about here. Um, so to build DBNs, we uh, train these <coughs> RBNs really one at a time, uh, training the next one off the outputs of the previous. Um, and in our system, um, we are um, using Bootswick's Turk data set. Um, the models train predict AB means, and um, the input looks like this, uh, is, is raw magnitude spectra at about 20 millisecond windows. And this is just like all the other standard acoustic features. So we can provide something uh, to com actually compare to them. Uh, the model itself uh, has 50 nodes at each layer. Um, and then as the output, we're only trying to predict the mean of the collected data in the AB space. So um, taking a model that's trained on that, we can, of course, look at um, what we get out of it. I'm sure everybody's heard this song before. It's a cover of it. My example's a little bit long, but I want you to kind of get the whole thing in your head, because then I'm going to try to reconstruct this. So the features that we get out of this, um, really the first layer I'm showing on the top here, um, it, it, you know, the largest dimensionality reduction happens where we go from 257 down to 50. Um, we can definitely still see uh, some of the sections of the song, although, of course, I think we notice that um, as we get to the higher layers, um, the variance um, gets, gets lower and lower. Um, and what's really interesting um, is to try to reconstruct this spectrogram. Now, after we do fine-tuning the DBN, we've thrown out um, any ways for reconstruction, but we can certainly play around with some linear algebra um, and uh, do a pseudo-inverse um, to see what we come up with. And it looks pretty bizarre, um, to be completely honest about it. Um, it seems to target very specific frequencies, although you still can see, um, if you look hard at it, some of the sections. This right here is a we call it pre-chorus. Um, if we want to construct, reconstruct this, we're, we're already starting from magnitude spectra, so we, we've already thrown out the fades. So if I try to uh, reconstruct just the audio, original audio itself from magnitude spectra, um, it sounds like this. It's very wall-loop. Um, so just a short example of that. But this is, um, the next thing I'm going to play is actually reconstructed from the audio itself, or from, from this itself, and um, you can hear that the tempo is still there. Nothing. <laughs> as much as it seems like we've thrown out a ton of information, it's, it's really still there, um, at least to some degree. So um, then what we want to do is to take these features and apply them to the problem of content-based music motion recognition to see how informative they are. Um, so I've looked at a bunch of standard acoustic features uh, to provide uh, means of comparison. Um, all these results are cross-validated five times. Um, and what we find overall is that spectral contrast uh, tends to be the best performing feature. Uh, this is with multiple wave regression. Um, and it's in a normalized space, so you can interpret these uh, values in mean distance as percentages. So we're about 13.8% uh, in error on average. Um, we also um, look at the Gaussian problem, predicting uh, both the mean and the covariance. Um, and really, these KL values, they need context, so you can really only compare them to each other. Um, but we see overall that that to be the best performing. Um, but I, I tend to emphasize that the mean distance is a much more important metric because the mean has to be accurate. If the covariance is uh, rotated incorrectly, um, 
you know, we can deal with that. If the mean is, is wrong, that, that's really bad. So now we'll look at using the DVN. Um, just using the model itself, uh, just taking the outputs um, of the regression uh, layer that I attached to that. Um, we're up at about 20% uh, error, um, but the best layer is layer two, and we um, get down to 13.3%. So we have a small amount of performance. Um, we do a little bit better in terms of an increase in KL. We go from 1.29 uh, down to 1.19. Um, but what we really want is a more sophisticated model than uh, multiple linear regression. So, question: You did try to use all the three layers? Uh, I did, but it didn't do any better, so I didn't okay. put it on the slide. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, <laughs> so the more sophisticated model we look at is conditional random fields. Um, so CRFs, you're trying to predict their, uh, the, the probability of, a, of labels Y given a set of features X. Um, there's no uh, generative model of the features. It's uh, completely deterministic. Um, and with it, what we try to do is use this heat map representation. Um, what, what you can essentially uh, think of is we're, we're binning um, the AV space um, and then each bin within the space represents a node in the model. And um, you can sort of think out of, of the conditional probabilities in terms of HMMs, or just transition probabilities. Um, and our, like, our actual heat map is 11 by 11, um, it looks something like that. So in order to use CRFs with audio data, um, we have to do a lot of quantization. Um, so first, um, we quantize our labels. When we train these, we are presenting the individual label sequences. Each one is quantized within that 11 by 11 space. Um, and one of the issues that happens immediately is that the neighborhood relationship of the grid cells is lost when I say, instead of saying that this is, you know, at this coordinate, it's in class five. Um, so it's not really there anymore. So what we do um, to try to get around that is we, uh, we duplicate each example another nine times and add a small amount of noise um, in, in order to give the model um, essentially the ability to learn um, that relationship. But we also have to um, we don't have to, but CRFs are highly optimized for binary features. Um, so what we do is um, we quantize each feature dimension um, into uh, 10 bins. We tried a lot of other, um, a lot of other more sophisticated um, schemes for this, and really just 10 level quantization is what, what tends to work the best. Um, and just to be more clear about that, we take each uh, feature dimension one at a time. Um, we collect all of them, um, take a histogram, break that up into 10 equal energy bins, and then for an individual feature uh, value, the uh, quantized value is just whatever bin it lies within. So um, first I'm just gonna show some examples of some action. So these are, um, these are all 15 second clips, so we can predict uh, at each step. And what we're looking at on the left is some collected data, and on the right is the uh, conditional probabilities. And what um, you should look for uh, that happens here is this song starts off um, as very, um, quiet and mellow, and then moves into this really hard rock first. So we're going from bottom left to top right. So the model does a pretty good job at, at tracking what's going on here. I had one other uh, video to show this because it's pretty cool. Um, this one, this is an angry example, a very angry example. So we're uh, starting off uh, hard bottom right and then um, sort of becoming, I would say, only less angry. <laughs> So maybe we think it's a little bit happier than the subjects do, but uh, in terms of intensity, we're right, and we're definitely not quite as angry as we were. So yeah, um, just to provide a, a form of comparison to our previous approaches, um, we want to be able to look at the mean distance. So all we do is we take the uh, AV values of each bin center um, and then multiply uh, those by their probability, um, and then we can get essentially a weighted mean within the space and produce continuous values. Um, so here, um, we see everything does better overall. Um, the um, layer two features are down from 13.3 um, to 12.5, um, which is significant. Um, but NFCCs jump way ahead. Um, they were up at uh, 14, and they're down to 12. Um, 
so this um, this really motivates us uh, to uh, to look into some other approaches. Um, and really, this is this is what we're working on right now. Um, and you know, current features are really all extracted from these 20 millisecond frames, but no human could identify emotion at that time scale. If I played a 20 millisecond clip, no, it would sound like a click. Um, so emotion is not expected to vary at this high of a rate, um, and instead we look into multiple time scales because we also believe that motion is influenced by what you already listened to. Um, so <coughs> we look into basically the, the same model, the same approach, but instead using aggregations of the past one second, the past two seconds, and the past four seconds, and then concatenating those together as inputs. Um, I'm going to go through some of this a little more quickly. Um, but here's the features we wind up with here. Um, I think that the uh, sections of the song seem to be a little bit more defined here. Of course, they look longer, but that's because we're, uh, our hop is, is much higher. Instead of hopping at 20 milliseconds, now we're hopping at one second, because that's our smallest window. Um, one of the things that um, isn't quite as, as cool about this is that it's much harder to analyze what's going on. I can't just say, oh, this is the magic emotion frequency. Not that we ever expected to find that, but um, so here now we're looking at um, three different uh, essentially domains, I'll call them, stacked on top of each other. Uh, essentially, we get a similar result, though. Um, now, comparing this to what we saw before, and this is back with the simple MLR approach, um, where these, these are um, our original results from the single frame, that's what I'm calling an SF. Um, and then if we look at this, um, we get slightly better um, with the, uh, the, the model error, um, down to 19.4. Um, and the, uh, the best now is uh, we're down into the range of 12, uh, 12%, um, which is uh, where the CRF was. But really, one of the, the great things about RBMs being unsupervised is we don't have to just uh, you know, use our small training data set um, in that, in that uh, unsupervised phase. Um, we have access to a much larger library of songs, uh, about 7,000, uh, when aggregated about 1.5 million examples. Um, so really, why not, why not start with that? Um, and have developed a really general model of music and then try to tune the music model uh, to emotion. And what we've seen here is, is we get uh, performance out of this as well. Um, so then going back to the features we looked at before, um, and we get the, the biggest increase really is in the model prediction. We get from 19.4 down to 14%, which is pretty significant. Um, and then when we look at the individual features, the, the, uh, the change isn't, isn't quite um, as large. Um, we really just go from 12.9 down to 12.8. Um, but it's, it's really interesting how, how much better um, the actual model got. And it's still unclear. Um, we haven't really tried these um, in the context of the CRF training. Um, the CRFs, we're running five cost validations. We're talking about 12 hours to train each one of those. We're talking about 12 hours to train each one of these DVNs. Um, but uh, really including, um, DVNs really show great promise in really developing models uh, of the relationship between acoustic content um, and emotion. One, because it's something that we don't really understand. And two, because um, perhaps we could get informative features out of it. Or perhaps, you know, from what I, I just showed, maybe, maybe it's the model itself, um, the DVN itself, that we want to use uh, to do the prediction. Um, so the, uh, the universal background model approach slightly improves uh, the model. Um, well, it simply improves the model, the features slightly. Um, and moving forward, perhaps we want to investigate uh, actually um, using the CRF um, within the context of a DBM, such as a deep structured conditional random field. Um, and I think we also want to look at it, um, investigating more granularity um, in the input uh, to the DBM. Um, so you have more levels of, of past knowledge of what's been going on.